Thanks so much for coming back. As I said before you left, we're going to have some questions, and your questions are going to be discussed by Paul and Byrne back and forth. And so um, sort of open questions are great, but any question or interest you have, um, feel free to share. And I'm sure these two can uh, spin webs with them. So <laughs> would anybody like to start? Yeah, I got one. OK, Joe, can you come over here so we can? I have a lot uh, of with you people, and that's great. <laughs> Yeah, if you have a question, if you can you can line up over here if you'd like. Um, <laughs> but we want to get it on the mic so that everybody can hear, including on the recording. No, no, we can. I can bring it over here to you. All right. So, Bern, this one's more for you because you are um, historically knowledgeable. Um, to which degree would you perhaps see this little corner of the internet and the things happen around it as? maybe history repeating itself in some way? No, I don't think this is a repetition. I think it's something that, yes, it's related to things in the past, but I think we are seeing something different. I'm not saying this to pump us up at all. I'm just simply saying, I think some of the things that have been happening online, there's been different kinds of things happening. And some of them are kind of in vague ways related to each other. I mean, there are different people who are questioning certain kinds of things and and it's not all the same thing if you go to uh, one one set of people it's going to be right-wing things and another set of people it might be technological things or it might be religious things but I think what this is 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 fascinating to me because it's it is different you see, you see here's the thing time never repeats and so we are living in a new time therefore anything we do has to have a new edge on it somewhere. And I, I really believe that, I'm not saying this could all fade away in a week or two. And maybe the estuary is just training wheels for something coming up, but, and we'll be able to, you know, we've lost the, um, the ability to, something happened where it became very difficult to have real conversations. And that's not to say that people all along the way haven't been able to talk one-on-one -on -one to each other or one and two or three people and have really good conversations. But when you look at the general tone of society, you just don't see it. And I remember almost a, a year, it seemed, when things really changed. It was about 1975. And up to that point, I remember I'd become this weird Jesus people Christian. And I could talk to almost anyone, and they were fascinated to talk to me. And then at a certain point, they just lost interest in talking, or they started, this line kept getting repeated all the way. Well, that's true for you. As if we didn't all live in the same world, experiencing many of the same things. And I think it relates to what Owen Barfield calls, originally you have participation. And what he's talking about is, you're way too participated in, you know, it's just, you're, you, you can't walk through certain trees because you're afraid of the spirits. And, and you can't, uh, you know, certain mountains are holy and, and such. And, but it also relates to things like people. And, and one of the reasons I moved to Georgia is because there are still people there who literally sit around a table singing or just get up and feel moved to dance and start moving without this thing that you see in Western Europe, in all the Anglosphere, and that is this crippling self-consciousness and irony at seeing ourselves doing these things, of singing together without feeling, I wonder what I look like right now trying to do this. You know, so I think we're in a place, we haven't arrived at the point where we can recover it, and this would be the final participation of Barfield, but we're in a place where he, what he says is, the things that have been lost, and the good things, not just the, the taboos and, and things like that, which I think can stay uh, in the past. But I think that, what is it? It's just that we can recover singing together. It, unfortunately, given who we are, it's not going to happen overnight. So maybe now we're meeting together in groups to talk. I've had a different experience in Labrie, in Switzerland, talking in what, what they call formal meals and such. But even at Labrie, they didn't, couldn't get to the stage where they could sit around a table singing. And I would like that 
one day we might be able to get to that. And I think that's, in a sense, the goal is to restore many of the things that have been thrown off, cast off in the dust as just kind of like dorky or stupid. <laughs> See what I mean about irony, though. <laughs> You know, when, when I think about the the houses of worship, the churches, the cathedrals, they are cycle technologies and they continue to function and we don't know how they operate. And we don't know how to operate them. Um, there, there's always sort of a recurrence that happens and you sort of go back and you relearn, but then the next thing is different from the last. So um, I think that tends to be how, how history works. Okay, Manuel's got a question. Yeah, I, I want to capture the talk you just gave um, and have you guys reflect on it a bit because what I heard was there's uh, in modernity, the masculine spirit uh, got perverted somehow and got pointed at materiality. And then after that, the feminine spirit got perverted and pointed at materiality in, in the sense that you're, you're creating this, this arena and then you're expecting the arena to, to manifest the spirit without uh, attending to the spiritual aspect. And then in, in the later stages, right, where we're now, we're, we're trying to point back up, but we don't know where up is. And, and so people are pointing everywhere, trying to get away from, from the materiality, but not realizing the playing field that they're on. So yeah, does that resonate? And like, how do you how do you see that? Yeah, it was good. That was good. I liked how they're pointing everywhere because they don't know. I mean, for, to have Sam Harris say what he said yeah. after everything that's gone on was just draw job, you know, jaw dropping. It's <laughs> dyslexic speech. Yeah, it just just was. We don't know what up is. That's exactly where we're at. Yeah. And also, I think there has been, you see, like I said about the different periods, uh, different eras, ages, in the modernist age, it was all about matter. And matter, as Owen Barfield points out, was emptied of meaning, becoming an idol that had no particular significance. Everything was just, you know, after I was just sex, it's just you know, a family, it's just evolution, it's just this, just that. But I think then you came to this other version where it was suddenly irrational and suddenly everything is like floating in the sky. Francis Schaeffer called this the, what was it? A, uh, existential methodology. And that is to say, so you take the, the modernist version and go like, reason leads to despair or as Goya painted the sleep of reason leads to monsters but no one can live in that despair and so they just invent something or they cling to something whether it's drugs or sex or travel I think all most digital nomads are are as uh, Walker Percy says they're they're out there but they don't know how to re-enter you know they're trying to find transcendence through travel but it's also tr transcendence through collecting transcendence through online gaming all of these things are ways that we transcend and what's weird is that we've lost track of the material world because we despised it and then we turned away from it and and tried these weird ways of it's just irrational ways of finding something to give us meaning but I think we have a chance in this age of reaffirming the value of that, that God created the world and it was good. There's still goodness in those trees and there's still goodness in your, your bodies and there's still goodness in being incarnated and there's still reality to Jesus Christ being the incarnation of God. And so I think that that is what we have a chance to explore. And I think, like I said, we're at the beginning of this new period. It's definitely, we've, we've slipped out of something. And some people will go full-on Gnostic. But I think we're not those people, I don't think. I don't see evidence of that among us. So that's a good sign.
Paul, you talked about the, the signs that we have to put up not to feed the wild animals. And I felt that the answer was a very adult one with regards to the relationship we want to create to those adults, uh, to those to those animals. Because when I look at my small children, at my three children, they are in a sacred relationship with the animals, knowing that they are part of creation. They feel the enchantment without having to create anything. Mm -hmm. And uh, Byrne talked about the juvenilization of society and of culture. And I wonder how is it possible to become childlike without being childish? Because I think that is a fundamental distinction. So I, I haven't been able to make too many videos on Oliver Sacks yet. But Oliver Sacks, the man who mistook his woman for his wife for a hat, um, the section, the last section in the book, the last third of the book on the simple, I think is super helpful for us, especially as we contemplate what um, Curtis Yarvin or Paul Kings North calls the machine. Because the, the children are simple in that sense. Now, children, unlike... Uh, the other simple that he talks about uh, grow up and become masters of management like we are. And that's, that's a powerful, good, fine term. I mean, when I go to um, Yosemite National Park and I see someone feeding a, um, uh, someone feeding an, a wild animal, they shouldn't feed the wild animal. But the... Uh, a child will go up to a piano and bang on it. And that, okay, they want to make music. Um, we then come along with the child and say, would you like to play this piano? And now you're going to learn discipline. And they're going to learn scales. And they're going to take years and years of lessons because now they're going to find a new kind of freedom. And I think the child is directed rightly that the child knows that there's a union with those animals that the child deeply desires, but the child is not yet ready. Just like the child is not yet ready for the piano. And I think what God does through all of this for us is to in fact, get us ready for that union with the animals and union with creation. Um, and I think that's, you know, that's what Romans eight talks about. You know, the true travails of creation, they're longing for the, the, the sons of God to be revealed. And I think what that means is for, for us to grow up into, as C.S. Lewis writes about in the miracles of the old creation, the miracles of the new creation, where we will have a communion with the animals that is once again restored and proper. And so the children know, but they can't. And, um, and what what we need to do is to continue to grow up until we can, but too often, well, I'd love to play the piano. Okay. Um, that's going to cost you. What's it going to cost me? Years. Years, but we're hasty. Yeah. I used to live in Alaska and one of my jobs there for about 10 years was taking people out into the wilderness and, uh, and off of cruise ships. We would get one a week in our town, the town of Haines, and uh, for a few years, I took people on trips to see bears, where the idea of not feeding the animal is not only important, but it's something that if you violate that rule, you have violated the relationship with the bear and you could pay for it. And I was able to get, I, I would have to give people a safety talk. And it's amazing how much they didn't understand. So what I would have to do at the beginning is kind of scare them a little to get their attention and, and tell them, you know, I'm about six feet tall. You know, I, I would say, you see how tall I am? And they go, yeah. He goes like, yeah, they, I, I once saw a bear this tall. And they go, oh, and I go, yeah, sitting down. And I, I wanted them to get the idea that you're not going to someplace tame here. It's not going to be what you predict. The bear's sense of reality has absolutely nothing to do with what you believe. This is one of my big problems with uh, certain philosophies is that people rely so much on the text or so much on, you know, coming to these ideas of what things believe in. Meanwhile, I'm living in a world where the bear is the king. Once I, if I walk 100 yards, 100 meters off the road, I start thinking about bears. 
But to be in a good relationship with a bear can also mean this. See that, that van back there? It's open. I could have a mother and two bear cubs sitting there fishing. I could be sitting here without a car, taking pictures without a telephoto lens, and the bear is fine with me because I know I have a relationship with that bear. I know why it's there. It's fishing. As long as I don't get, I also know enough about bear behavior to know one thing bears hate is being surprised. So we will do nothing surprising. One thing I'm never going to do is run because that's kind of surprising to a bear. And they say, huh, should I chase you? So, and you can't outrun a bear because they can run 50 kilometers, kilometers an hour, about 35 miles an hour, just like that. And you can't, uh, or Usain Bolt can't. So, but nevertheless, I can sit there with, in the most dangerous of all situations, the bear has two or three cubs there. And one of them could wander off and accidentally get on the wrong side of me. But I keep an eye on that because I'm in relationship and I have to know the relationship to the bears. And one of the problems is, is that many people today really need, they, they, they're desperate for that relationship, which is why they're willing to do very stupid things like try to feed the bear. But they don't understand the bear. They haven't taken any time to understand the bear. And if they did, this, this would open up. The relationship would open up. But if they don't, then they don't understand something fundamental about that bear. To kind of play off that, where, where do you see estuary being this place of uh, danger? And how do you create the right relationship within that? sort of space. I just, so, uh, is Hannes here? Yeah. Uh, he made an interesting observation the other day. The name of my site is The Anadromous. The, well, it started as The Anadromous Life. Anadromous is a scientific word describing salmon fishing upstream. And here's the interesting thing. What is the place, where do we go to look for the bears? At the estuary. And what's happening there? The salmon are swimming against the current to get home to spawn. And who else is there? The bears and the eagles. And everybody else is there to pick them off and make sure they don't get there. And I think that's just an interesting metaphor. You know? And so we have, to, it's not, we have to be, as Jesus said, wise as serpents, gentle as doves. We have to understand we are in a place, you know, we've had a little bit of someone kind of criticizing what we were doing here and in the wrong hands that criticism could take on we don't know uh, what kind of reaction so we have to understand that people are we we are in a place that is between worlds between the big wide ocean with its whales and sharks and the river which still has its dangers but it's it's pointing home I, Peterson, you know, one of his early things was um, chimps filled with snakes. And, uh, yeah, y'all are that too. Roughly speaking. Roughly speaking. <laughs> yeah. And, no, there's, there's, there's a lot that can go wrong. At Wal Walker Percy also in uh, Lost in the Cosmos talks about the fact that, you know, to look someone in the eye and then to hold their look. I mean, it, it's powerful. And, and if you're not adding words to it to sort of bring logos to the terror, you know, we, we know how dangerous we are. And our, our danger, yeah, bears are dangerous. <laughs> They're not anywhere dangerous, as dangerous as we are. We can defeat each other with a word, a reputation, an insinuation. I mean, we've got so many ways to attack each other. Yeah, there's, there's a lot of danger in this. There's no question that, about that's it. That's also where the fishermen go. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, but what, what else, what else do we got? You know, not doing, letting, letting a life flow by, um, screw tape, screw tape letters, uh, uncle Wormwood or uncle screw tape says to Wormwood, you know, the best way to capture a man's soul is to just keep them basically, I'll rephrase it a little bit busy and distracted their whole life long so that they, they never think a thought. They never do a thing. And it's just boom, 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 done. Netflix boxes. Netflix boxes instead of homes, yeah. yeah. 
So my question is after moving on from where you've left. You've yeah, um, my question has moved on from where, where you left off, so I'd like to just maybe take a small step back before the Andromenus. Um, a term was introduced coinciding with the claim um, that all, um, and all it possessed, uh, sorry, I'm going to, going to start again because I wrote this down, but I, I think I could probably just close that and uh, speak into the mic. Um, you, you talked about epochs, so you talked about eras and ages within ages, and um, I guess coinciding with this um, uh, anxiety about uh, the change of our climate and all that I that implies, and all the things that are that are dragged along with that. There was the introduction of uh, Anthropocene, the idea that we were uh, in undoubtedly morphing the structure of of, uh, of our planet so that it can be recognised um, deep into the future. And of course, this deep into the future is within our own imagination as well. Um, what kind of concerns me though is at the same time that a uh, a sense or a, a word like the Anthropocene is introduced, we also have a fragmentation, as you mentioned, of, of, of ourselves. Um, something like a schizophrenia, a, a fragmenting of, of who we are together in relationship to one another. And and um, I just, uh, I muse sometimes on, on perhaps archaeologists of the future looking back and not really seeing the the great feats that we achieved but actually looking on that downloadable fragment perhaps of this complete and utter uh, fragmenting of, of, of ourselves and, uh, and so on and just wondering on, on, on how that happened and and I think this relates to attention and I think this relates to developing a vessel or a body or reforging the body um, the body community and I just wonder how that um, in your own minds uh, how it uh, conflicts with the fact that what we're doing here right now is of course embodied but when we leave today and we go and search for what was recorded today we're interacting with the same technology that brings about a change an alteration of our, our perception and the other thing I'm just wondering is, is this what we're doing right now, a re-emergence of a monasticism in response to that, in response to the loss of the, the body or the vessel? It's, it just strikes me that a lot of our pastimes or a lot of our undertakings seem to be isolated pursuits, a lot of it intellectual, a lot of it reminds me of the Irish saints, for example, heading off into the wilderness and reading and copying scripture. That's that will come to mind. So into your into your mic, please. Oh, sorry, I'm back. Uh, remember, the Irish were the ones who brought civilization back to the darkness of the Dark Age, because they did save so many documents and they did save their faith, and they went off to places like Skellig Michael and you know Columbus, uh, the, the Saint Columba went out to Northern Ireland, and they ended up in Germany even, you know, but I think when I say we're in a new age, there's new dangers. And of course, a lot of people are going to be fighting a rear guard action of looking at the things in the recent past, thinking we're still there. And, and in some ways, those things haven't died. You know, it's just like uh, Babylonian religious religion is still with us. It's called astrology. You know, the Roman world is still with us. It's called the Catholic Church. And I'm not being funny about that. It really is still with us. You know, these things never just simply disappear. But I think we do have to pay attention to, right now we're on a road it, where we're coming up to some forks in the road, but we really can't make out what the signs are and what, what it, which way to go on those roads. Except, and, and going with what Paul was saying about relational, I think the only real signpost we have is that we must try to find the relational and the good, what is the good relationship? And, and I, I said this in my time series, I think the good relationships go with time and the bad relationships seek to short circuit time and get someplace too quick to, to make time possessed. But I think the good relationships re realize, okay, this is slow, but it's time. This is painful, but it's in time. But all the good relationships happen in time. 
So I have a bit of a relationship with Paul, and it's been about two or three years now that we've been talking online. And the reason like, I feel like I know Paul a bit, even though this is the first time I've actually really met him, is because we've already put a bit of work in time in that relationship. But I've often thought the most evil person in the world, or the most evil kind of thing in the world, would be the person or system that could say, you can have anything you want now. And the closest you could get to that wish and the fulfillment would be a, a basically a, a representation of how evil you are. Because suddenly you're willing to violate people, you're willing to violate time and space to make things happen for you now. And of course there are very, very rich people who can approximate something like that. But I think also we have to have something that, for instance, a rock star in 1970s playing in a, a, a huge uh, I don't know, sports coliseum never had. We have to have humility. It's not, I think Tarkovsky, talking about art, said something very important. He said, the artist is always a servant. And he also said, art is really not primarily about self-expression. We are, and, but I think you could extend that and say, essentially, we're all servants. How do we help each other in our relationships? How do we learn to trust one another? How do we learn to give? So if I go home, I will certainly pick up quite a few names here. And maybe some of you will, you know, we will connect in different ways. Some people say, oh, I didn't know you had a website. And they'll hit subscribe. Someone else will give me their email address and say, I want to keep asking questions. Uh, someone else will say, I got to send you this link. Uh, who was it you just uh, told me about the architecture book? Where are you? Yeah. So it, it, it's, uh, you know, there will be these connections. Now, the world is too big and there are too many people and you can't pay attention to everything and uh, unfortunately and that's one of the problems I think Paul has much more than I do how many subscribers do you have now enough enough <laughs> yeah <laughs> uh, I, and and at a certain point you lose the thing that that it's becoming too big for you it's becoming too problem but this for Paul is the human level and this is I think we should always be seeking to find the human level. So at a certain point, uh, like the Hutterites do, when their colonies get too big, they split. They start a new colony. Yeah. One of, one of the real takeaways I got from Jonathan Peugeot is the observation that um, the New Jerusalem is the incorporation of technology. It's the addition. The Book of Revelation is really the appropriation of the prophetic visions through the incarnation of Christ. <coughs> and, and so that vision of Isaiah 60, where the kings of the earth build their treasure, bring their treasures, gets built into this new city. At the end of the Bible, we don't go back to a garden. <coughs> so I want to refill this? Thanks. <coughs> There's a, there's a city. And so somehow God takes this stuff and uses it. And so on one hand, yeah, shrewd as serpents, innocent as doves, where we've got this world, we've got this stuff, we're going to make mistakes, but, and perhaps not all of us should use all of it, but thank you. Um, but I, th I don't think we have any other choice. And I think what happens in the new creation is Christ takes this stuff and says, it's the stuff I seeded. It's mine after all. I wanted you to develop it. Yeah, you went off the rails a lot of ways with it. But we're going to take this into the age to come. Yeah, Jack DeLille makes the same point in his book, The Meaning. Jack DeLille makes the same point uh, in The Meaning of the City. And he says that in the beginning, there was a garden, which isn't the same as saying the wilderness, because a garden is always manicured, taken care of. But the final image is the image of the New Jerusalem, which is a city. But then he points out, and the city is the place where we have been the worst. 
That is to say, we have, we have thrust our, our fists up at God saying, we are great. Look at the buildings we can build. You know, look at Dubai. You know, it's just like, this is what we can do. We've got money. We've got power. But also, it's the place where so much crime, so much human degradation, so much tension and pressure. I mean, it, uh, I've lived in New York City. I know. It, it wears you down, a city like that. But God takes our, what, what we wanted best out of it, a place of protection, a place of where the best of humanity can come together and says, this will be the new heaven and the new earth. Do we have any more questions? Oh, Peter. Thank you. How do you know if uh, you are trying to revive traditions that you are not uh, LARPing, it's more a question to uh, burn powers. How do you know that you're really genuinely reviving a tradition and it's not some fake uh, layer of irony or uh, not genuine? That's a, re that's a really good question. And I think many of us don't know the answer. One thing I would suggest is to, to study certain things, find out how things were done, but you don't imitate in the same sense. You don't put on the costume and pretend. You know you can't be medieval. You, you can't be a Civil War soldier, you know, putting on blue or gray uniform and, and actually be a Civil War soldier. There is some value to that sort of stuff in keeping certain things alive. But, and I think, though, that it is a very difficult question. What I've understood in myself is to learn the lessons of the past and then start thinking of how would this apply. So I know better than to think I can get a group of people together and say, we're going to sing together because I do feel the value of that, that humans need singing much as they need vitamin C, much as they need protein. That, that things like texture as well. If we live in a, a flat world, the kind of world you see in so many big, ugly buildings, if, if we live in that world, we're missing something. But what's the answer? Well, one of the reasons I went to Georgia is because they still do that, not all the time, not as much as they used to, but it's still there. And as, as it says, to strengthen the things that remain. Well, it remains there, and I'm there to, not just there to share whatever I have, but I'm there to learn these things. And maybe I can find some principle, some way to actually pass on, for instance, how to sing without actually doing it like, you know, you see yourself doing it. It's interesting when you put a, a video camera in a room and you start walking around people, they'll see it and then they'll start doing like hey you know they, they put on this face that's just for the video camera if, if you didn't have it but at the same time like i noticed that doesn't happen that doesn't happen as much in georgia because they don't have the same mentality that we do so i find it interesting you know and when i see videos of people playing music on youtube from georgia they just don't seem to have the same idea that this would make them look stupid or make them, you know, or nor are they trying to perform in the same sense. So anyway, uh, does that help? Well, C.S. Lewis noted that um, if you want to, if you want to do something, basically you have to master it. Don't try to be original. Just follow, follow the discipline and in the end, you will probably be able to make an original contribution. Mm -hmm. And also, there's a sense, uh, Rookmacher talks about style in art, and people, he say, Americans always come up to me and they say, how do I develop a sense of style? And he goes like, oh. And, uh, and, he, and he says that you don't develop a sense of style. You are the style. You can't help but do things differently than anybody else. Now, you need to learn from other people. You need to see something. You know, I started learning puppetry uh, not that long ago, maybe 15 years ago. But I didn't worry about whether I was original or not. In fact, I was very 
dead set on learning the traditions, learning the stories, like Faust is a very important story in puppetry. So I eventually made a, 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 a play called 21st Century Faust, 21st Century Faust, and it was for, basically for this young class of students I had. And in the story, uh, Faust is invited by Mephistopheles to sell his soul. And Mephistopheles says, what do you want? And he goes like, well, I want all the knowledge in the world. I want to connect to everybody. I want, I just want everything. And, they, and, and Mephistopheles says, okay, meet me here tomorrow at midnight and I'll give it to you. So he goes with him the next day at midnight. They disappear into this time tunnel. They come out in the 21st century. And Mephistopheles turns around and hands him a smartphone and says, here you are. And then he looks around and says, wait a minute, everybody else has one of these too. I says, well, you didn't think you were the only one, did you? But it's just a little silly little version of the Faust story. I would never call it a work of art. But, all I, but I'm pretty sure there isn't another one. And so, and, and I didn't worry about being original. I just said... How do we make this? I, I just need to do the, a version of this. I think this thing kind of connects to it, and there you are. But I think that's kind of how that works. Any more questions? I have one. Oh, sorry. Um, I have a question about transcendence, and I'm trying to kind of think about how I want to formulate the question. I'm kind of grappling with it. So at one point during your talk, uh, you, you mentioned something about at one point throughout history, people started focusing on self-improvement and how they want to develop themselves. And th these are some of the ideas that I'm grappling with myself. And I really believe that it, it, the, more, the, more you, if the more you want to bring something to the world or in, a theological, uh, in theological terms like serve God, the more you have to develop your own character to do so. And the more you develop your character, the more you can do. And I don't think the idea of transcendence is lost on people, but it seems like for some reason, most people decide that there's a plateau to how much they want to develop. And it's not like a conscious decision. It's, it's almost as if people don't want to develop further than they already can or they're comfortable with. I mean, they can more than that, obviously, right? And I'm trying to understand what's what's stopping people from de uh, developing further than uh, what they already are. So, why why are not, why are not people always aiming for something higher as a continuous thing, not as a like I'll do this and I'll come to a higher position and then stop, but like a continuous journey? Because I said like the idea of transcendence is not lost on people. I really believe that because even if the example of Dubai. For a lot of people, those skyscrapers and tall buildings are the uh, connection between heaven and earth. And for them, that is that. But the more you'd focus, let's say, on developing your character or you learned from the past and uh, uh, get, get deeper, let's say, into the uh, biblical stories or whatever it is, you, you, there's more value you can get out of other buildings like churches, for instance, or cathedrals. And the more you'd be able to appreciate it. But for whatever reason, people seem to be putting plateaus on their development. Well, I'm going to let Paul handle this. I'm going to let Paul handle this more in a moment. It's for both of you. Anyways. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But I, I just want to say this because I think Paul will have a better answer. And one of the things I've learned, and this is through, I got it through Rookmacher, who then pointed me to the Dutch reform tradition, is that I don't know if you can transcend yourself. Well, not yourself, as in, it's almost as if people put artificial limits. No, but you know, I think that what it is is that Sometimes people think, see, there's always this other thing holding us down. The Bible talks about sin, but it's also that thing when you look in the mirror and we really don't understand ourselves. You know, we are caught between the good that God created, but also the evil that we find around us and find inside of ourselves. So what do you think? Look at what our culture values. Well... You would be famous and beautiful and wealthy like Kim Kardashian. There's, there's, there's the aspiration right there. But there it is. I mean, that's, that's what people want. And that's what's placed in front of them. That's what's celebrated. That's what gets all the attention. Um, I think if, you know, the older traditions had saints. 
oh, that's, you know, far more costly. I always say there's two lines. There's the line, people wanting to be loved, let's say, and people wanting to love. The line in terms of people wanting to be loved goes on forever. You're going to get in the back and wait around to be loved. The line to love is no line at all. You can start right now. There's a whole world around you of people waiting, wanting to be loved. No line at all. Go ahead. Do it. That's, you know, biblically, that's the higher goal. That's a lot harder. But to be loved? Oh, yeah. Everybody wants to be loved. So it's, it's, it's what our culture values and fame, fame, money, that's all the stuff there. And, um, I think some of our older cultures had other aspirations, at least to some degree held those, um, models higher and gave people something much richer to, to become. Um, if you guys don't mind, I want to comment on this. So. I see people, um, it's not as if this is just a, for, for what I see, I, I can't just link it to a cultural problem because it seems to be an international problem. So it's not just within a certain culture, but it seems like something that's happening worldwide because I believe even back in the past, even let's say in the biggest downfall of religion, would it be, I don't know, 19 or 20th century, there are still people that somehow pushed and transcended through that. And so there's something within the current world that's not just stopping people from transcending transcending it's more like can you give me an example just just to finish this point but i'll try um something stopping uh people from even answering the question of why bother and so i guess that will, would have been my example and so it's not like I, these ideas don't exist even in the world of the internet let's say for the first time ever humanity has access to all the knowledge that we already have uh, that we had historically more or less to a huge amount of resources and a huge amount of opportunity to self-improve so this opportunity device that exists but for some reason people have a difficulty with answering the question of why even bother doing it i would say number one that there are there are many saints among us why don't you know about them well what's on all the screens they're not Ooh. sexy enough. <laughs> and, you know, I, I think it's, I think that they, there's both sides of this, that there are saints among us, but um, to catch their stories, well, if you look, you can catch them and you can find them, but you won't find them, you won't find them with 3 million subs on YouTube and you won't find them on television. And the world increasingly has, you know, one unified culture. And so I, I think there's, I think there's problems on both ends. Yeah, and I also see, I think some of what you're talking about with transcendence, I think a better word for some of it might be perseverance. To persevere through the troubles. I mean, I look at it as kind of like, you know, there's rotating knives in front of you or there's there's crushing walls or something, but you, you can see a way through, but it's going to take something from you. And so whether it's, you know, spending time with a sick relative or whether it's just taking the time to know people uh, or, you know, working on yourself a bit so that you're not presenting this mess of a person, which we all kind of are to some degree or another, but you're still, you've got enough to give something to someone else. And for me, it's just sometimes life gets so thick, but. I just find you just don't stop. And even though you may not see a way out at all, you don't stop. And, and that's perseverance. You know. All right. We have time for one more question. Okay. Okay. So I, this is mostly, I think, a question for you. Um, I've noticed when riding around like you did in the Czech countryside now, mm -hmm. instead of just churches as the centerpieces of town, you get the old factories, right? With the big smokestack that basically is trying to emulate the psycho technology of the church, right? Mm -hmm. um, and they are not kept, <laughs> they are totally abandoned and left to die, but they still stand there, you know, having this uh, reminding I don't know, but have you ever reflected on 
what was the symbolism of that and how, how, how oh, yeah, they thought about it, that. To me, it's pretty clear. Okay. And that is to say, when I talked about the different ages, of course, the religion of Western uh, of society has been predominantly Christianity and, and the church tower was usually in most uh, Christian countries supposed to be the tallest building in the, in the town. And uh, even in Georgia, there, there is a thing where there's one church and they try to keep it taller than the rest, but the, these new modern buildings are threatening it. But then they entered the modern age through communism. And in communism, the factory, I mean, Stalin used to make musicals about tractors. And the factory was this very special place in the socialist communist world. And so what they've done is they made a replacement for the Christian temple. But now that one's dead. And the Czechs very firmly have embraced the post-1967 world. And they were very attracted to it uh, in many ways, uh, even back when they were in the communist world. They have the John Lennon Wall Memorial, which says to me everything about who their saints are. And it's also one of the most atheistic countries in the world. And so for them, it's this, these things, um, it, you know, and it's not so much about the height of buildings anymore. But, yeah, well, but the Czech, Czech Republic is really complicated. But that's what I can say right now. If you want something to last, build it beautiful. Yeah, that's what Roger Scruton's message. All right, well, let's give them a hand for answering all our questions. <laughs>